We all have this nostalgia for the way things used to be, for, for fishermen as a noble profession. But fishing has really changed. We're talking about factories at sea. If you think about like what fishing actually looks like, it's rounding up all of the buffalo on the Great Plains. It's shooting every bird out of the sky. The observers on fishing vessels, their role is to document illegal fishing practices on the high seas. Dozens and dozens of Pacific Island observers have died because they bear the truth of the actual industry's face and what they have been hiding from us. James was a shy person. He was a gentle person. He went missing. Four observers died in Papua New Guinea. Uh, all suspicious cases. Drugging is definitely a danger for observers. We used to always joke about it, you know, and say, oh, God, they could just throw you overboard, but we never really believed that anybody would do that. James went overboard. Oh. It defies belief that so many observers slip and fall into the sea. And like any homicide or murder investigation, you need to look at motive. So we're starting to peel back some of the layers that shroud this industry. Again and again, observers who have disappeared. It's harrowing. It, you know, him going over the side was, you know, it's disgraceful that, that this has happened. And it's deeply affecting. You see somebody die on video and we know from what followed that there's been an incomplete investigation. Secrecy is king in the fishing industry. We had no actual number of observers being killed. Authorities are not investigating these things. What's going on is political corruption. This is a move by China to seize control in the Pacific. China is the biggest distant water fishing nation. It's all about the highest bidder. China is the predator, and we are the prey. Its influence is rough. Bribes, payments, corruption. Their business model is depleting the oceans to the point where they collapse. There is a race to catch the last fish that's happening. We have this drive toward cheap food. It's great to talk about sustainability, but nobody's happy to pay for it. Once this fishery goes down, it's gone. People are getting desperate for fish. They can sacrifice a person in order to get their money. Observers are the direct threat to them maintaining the multi-billion dollar nature of the industry and their profit margin. My role with Tim and his team is to have a voice for these observers. When you're looking at retracing an event, like an observer going missing, it's quite sobering that as you look through the lines of data, you can see that the vessel had just moved on and had continued fishing. They are swept under the carpet. They are made to go away. Until we can uncover and expose them, these things will go on. It started with my friend and colleague, Keith Davis, uh, who disappeared in 2015. Can you tell me a little bit about what happened to Keith? Oh, he was murdered. I mean, I have no doubt about that. Keith was passionate about the oceans. And he was a free spirit. And he was a good person. And, you know, there, it, to me, there's no question that he was murdered. When you look at the totality of the circumstances, the fact that he wrote the book on observer safety and security, he didn't just trip and fall overboard. When it happened to him, I said, God, I hope they killed him before they threw him overboard. Because I couldn't think of anything worse than being set adrift at sea and watching 
the vessel pull away knowing that you're gonna die. It was more important to them to hide whatever activity they were involved in on board that vessel and, and kill a human being than, you know, it, it, there's just no justice in it. I need, a, I need to just go off. <laughs> government shield the companies. Evidence gets buried. The observer is the witness to what's going on out there. Throughout history, the powers that be in the Pacific have fortunes abounded on tuna. Tuna fishing began in the ancient Black Sea and Mediterranean area. The traditional way of tuna fishing by the Matanza. People stand on prominent positions, look down on the sea and see the armies of tuna marching into the Mediterranean and the tuna then find themselves entering a city of nets. When they come to the surface they're hauled into the boats. This, this is a, a very ancient fishing method which has been around for more than 2,000 years. Funnily enough, in the 20th century, tuna fishing was quite a low value activity and then really was boosted in the aftermath of World War II. We actually adopted a lot of the technology that was developed during World War II to hunt down tuna and other species on the high seas. And so fishing spread like a wildfire around the globe. We're at war with the ocean, but it's the kind of war where no one wins. But anytime you have an industry of that size pursuing a wild product, there's going to be collateral damage. We can consume these fish out of the ocean more than any other animal on Earth. We are a super predator. Tuna, quite simply, are the world's most valuable fish. Tuna fishery is international big business. This mode of production it's more a distillation process. Produce an extremely valuable product. A bowl of Soshima on a per kilogram basis is like a drug. You hear absolutely horrible stories about the people who are involved in this. It's run by Yakuza. This is a gangster operation. They're really dangerous people. They're willing to do anything for our money. Can we make a profit in three months? Yes, we can do that with tuna. Can we make it in 10 years? No. Five years? No. But it doesn't matter. We'll just sell it. They say that's an advantage of capital, to be able to move it around so quickly. It's not an advantage to tuna. But people are doing it with diamonds and gold, so why not just apply that commodity thinking to animals? Mitsubishi is not just a car company. It freezes for extinction. You're planning to drive this thing extinct. You're like poised to make a ton of money off of it. So there is sort of a race to the bottom, a race to catch the last fish that's happening. We sold these commodities and we love them. Producers created that appetite. They created a demand. You know, the whole notion of a canned tuna and the commodification of a wild product, that might be the problem. Skipjack tuna are at risk everywhere they turn, from every country, from every appetite, caught one place, processed another, consumed somewhere else. Once you have canneries, supply chains, it's very hard to dial that back. So all of the elements are in place for a collapse. I can imagine a world without tuna. I would just feel a loss. We will adjust to whatever the future holds. So it's our obligation to ensure it's full of life. <laughs>